morning, good morning. Jeremiah Doyle is somewhat of a local boy. He grew up in Silverton, graduated from Silverton High School about 10 years, a little over 10 years ago. Went to Oregon State University and he received a bachelor's degree in, I think it's nuclear science. And he's a avid basketball player, as you can see by his hand. I think he must have. <laughs> I thought maybe he got a little too close to that nuclear reactor or something, but at any rate, you're going to be really amazed at what this company, New, uh, New Scale, is doing in regards to cutting edge nuclear energy. And please welcome Jeremiah Doyle to give us his presentation. See if we can get this taller. <laughs> Thanks so much for introducing me, Phil, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I had the opportunity to present to the East Salem Rotary Club earlier this year. This is a little bit more fleshed out than that, and I expect to have a lot of questions, so we'll see how, how fast we can get through some of these. I think I padded too much in here. But like Phil mentioned, I went to Oregon State University and studied nuclear engineering. I am a risk assessment analyst at New Scale Power. So what I do is I look at what are the likelihood of severe core damage accidents like Fukushima, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island. And specifically, I look at where does that radioactivity go in the environment? How can we safely evacuate people? And really, what are the consequences to the public? In this presentation today, I'll be giving a quick overview of New Scale as a company before delving more into fission power, nuclear power as it is in the world today, and then into the New Scale design. Then I'll be talking about used fuel and the fuel cycle, licensing a plant in the United States, and then where our first plant is expected to be. And I think I waited too long and this fell asleep. The global reality is that there are about 1 in 10 people that are chronically undernourished. There are 7 million deaths annually due to air pollution. And there are about 2, million, 2 billion people in the world that don't have access to, wa to clean water. And at least half of the global population doesn't have access to health services. And all of these things can be improved just by improving access to electricity. So New Scale's mission is to provide scalable, advanced nuclear technology for the production of electricity, heat, and clean water to improve the quality of life for people around the world. And this energy source is, is smarter, cleaner, and safer than the existing nuclear power fleet and really other power sources in general. And because of the way it's, it'll be manufactured and installed, it'll be much more cost competitive than the operating fleet. So really, who is New Scale Power? Well, New Scale was formed in 2007. It was based on early, early experiments in, two, in the 2000s, funded by the Department of Energy uh, at Oregon State University. And Jose, Dr. Jose Reyes at Oregon State really first started looking into natural circulation reactors in the late 90s and early 2000s. And then in 2007 with Oregon State University, we were able to, to, to start new scale power. In 2011, Fluor, a large construction engineering company, became the first major investor in new scale. And then a couple of years after that, the Department of Energy announced an award share, or, a fund sharing award with New Scale, where for every dollar that Floor invested, the Department of Energy would also invest a dollar, up to $200 million, so that we could get our plant licensed in the United States. There are over 485 patents granted or pending throughout the world, and we have over 350 employees in the United States and the UK, and we have about six offices. Our two major offices are here in Portland, and Corvallis is the engineering office. 
And it's very costly to get a nuclear reactor license in the United States. And to date, we've spent about $850 million going through this process. And we're on track for the first plant to be built in 2026 in Idaho on the Idaho National Lab site. And I'll talk more about that later. But on this, on this slide here in the top right corner, we have a picture of the offices in Corvallis. This is in the middle here is the test facility that's at Oregon State. And then at the bottom here, we have a picture of the control room simulator. And about twice a year, we open up the control room simulator for tours. And it's really cool to go in there and be able to see this new generation of control room. They even let some people sit down and, and, and be operators in the plant because of how, how much simpler it is. Nuclear energy in the United States is based on fission power. There are two types of nuclear energy. There's fusion and fission. And fusion is what occurs in the sun. That's when you take two light atoms and you force them together to become a heavier atom. And in that process, you, re you release energy. The opposite of that fission is the splitting of a heavier atom that releases energy and that is what we harness for operating nuclear reactors. This is a diagram. It's kind of, it's, it's not that bad to see, I guess, on the projector. But it shows a, a fission reaction. So in a fission reaction, we'll start here on the left. We have a neutron, some atop, a subatomic particle that hits a heavy atom like uranium that causes the uranium to be unstable and split into two smaller elements there, releasing energy and more neutrons. And that starts a chain reaction, and that is what we harness in the reactor. And when we have this chain reaction, it's called going critical. So going critical really isn't a bad thing. That's what we want. Going super critical is it sounds more exciting. I'm surprised that movies don't use that term, but that's, that's the condition you want to get away from. Supercritical is when you have the runaway reaction, like in nuclear weapons. But in a fission, reaction, a fission reactor, we use one neutron, and we produce multiple neutrons, and we end up using one again. And we keep that steady cycle going, continuing to release energy. Fission energy is the densest form of energy available on, on the planet right now. And this is a little bit hard to see because the uranium pellet is so small, but there on the bottom left here is this little tiny pellet next to this person. And that is one of the pellets in a nuclear reactor. That's about the size of your fingertip down to your fingernail. It's about the same diameter, same length. And they, there are multiple pellets stacked about six feet high in the reactor core. And there are hundreds of rods with all of those pellets stacked inside of them. But just that one pellet is so much more dense than the other forms of energy. It's about three barrels of oil, a ton of coal, 17,000 cubic feet of natural gas. I really have no idea how much that is. That's, so, that's so, such a large volume. The footprint of nuclear power is, is really much smaller. It takes way fewer reactors to get the same amount of energy. So on this graph here, we'll, we'll start at the top with a traditional nuclear reactor. That's about one gigawatt of power. And I'll do some more comparisons later to really understand what that looks like. But for Portland, that's about enough to, to power the residential needs of Portland. So we could use one traditional nuclear reactor, multiple Hoover dams, all the way down to 33 million photovoltaic solar panels. So it really takes a lot of these other forms of energy to really get the same output that, that we get here. And, and solar farms can be quite large. There's also the greenhouse gas emission portion of things. That's really a, a concern on people's minds today. And this graph here, this figure shows the grams produced per kilowatt hour. So a kilowatt hour is about what the average household uses in a year. 
And as you can see here on the, on the right hand side, we have the renewable sources of energy. Nuclear power is comparable. Hydro is the best. And where really the carbon emissions come from in these forms of energy is from the construction and mining of the materials that you need. Whereas over on the other side for gas and coal, it's really more about the production of energy itself that uses up, that creates that carbon dioxide. Radiation dose is something that's, that's really, it's really scary. It's, it's an emotional reaction. And so a, a different way of thinking about things is banana equivalent dose. There is really radioactivity in a lot of aspects of your life that, that you might not be aware of. And one of, those, one of those places is in a banana. There is a radioactive form of potassium that's naturally occurring and that is in bananas. And so you can use bananas as kind of a metric to think about other forms of radiation exposure. So here on the bottom of this graph, or on this table, is the yearly dose from living next to a nuclear power station. And that could be anywhere from one to 100 bananas. So if you're eating a banana every day, you're already getting more radiation exposure than you would get from living right next to a nuclear power plant. And it, it slowly goes up. There's these things that you experience throughout the year, getting an x-ray at the dentist, that's about 50 bananas of a cross-continental flight is about 400 bananas, and that's just because you're so high above the atmosphere, you're really not protected from that space radiation. And then as you go up, it takes an insane, an unimaginable amount of bananas to, to have any ill effects. So really, even the, the dose that we use to target cancer and radiotherapy, that's 20 million bananas. And, and if you target that in the right spot, it can be really beneficial, but it would really take about 100 million bananas within, uh, you would have to eat those in the span of about a day. And that would be a fatal dose within two weeks. So yeah, be, be sure to lay off the bananas. We don't, wanna, we don't wanna eat too many. 100 million I think might be doable. Uh, all right, so how does a nuclear power plant work? Well, it's really not that different from other sources of thermal energy like natural gas or coal. And this diagram right here shows the typical operating plants and how they produce electricity. So here on the left-hand side, we have the reactor vessel, and that's where the fission reaction takes place. You heat water in this inner loop, and then that goes on to heat water in a secondary loop. That creates steam, which then spins a turbine. That turbine spins a generator, producing electricity for the city to use. And then as that steam flows through the turbine, it returns to liquid water. And to fully condense it, we go through this third loop that would go out to a river, the ocean, uh, cooling towers, things like that. And then we feed that water back in and that loop continues. This is a pressurized water reactor in this diagram. There's really two types of reactors in the world, boiling water and pressurized water. Really the difference is in a pressurized water reactor, we want to keep this inside loop liquid water and, and create steam in a secondary loop. In a boiling water reactor, there would really only be two loops. We would just boil this directly from the core instead of having these, these two separate loops. And the United States tends to favor pressurized water. We like that extra barrier between the radioactivity and the steam turbine. And the, the rest of the world likes to use boiling water reactors. This is another diagram of a pressurized water reactor and we'll see this collapse into what the new scale design looks like. I'll finally be talking about new scale after about 10 minutes here. Um, so here we see the steam generators, the pressurizer to keep the water in a liquid state and then reactor coolant pumps and this forces that cooling loop through the core and then through the steam generators. And in the new scale design, what we've done is we've taken the pressurizer and the steam generators and we've put them in the pressure vessel with the reactor core. And then we've eliminated the need for reactor coolant pumps. And eliminating those reactor coolant pumps is really a, a huge in, improvement in safety in our design. One of the most likely sources of accidents 
in operating reactors today is the loss of the coolant pump seal. That's one way that you can really lose all that water that's covering your core. And by just not having that at all in our design, we don't rely on that seal and we don't rely on electricity to keep water, cooling water going over the core. And so here's really what the, what the new scale modular reactor looks like. So on the outside here, we have containment. This, instead of the large concrete domes that you might typically associate with nuclear power plants, in the new scale design, we have a kind of thermos design. We have this outer steel vessel. It's much more robust than concrete structures. It's really able to withstand much more severe conditions. And then inside of that, we have a vacuum instead of insulation. That really helps us with our emergency cooling systems. I'll go into that a little bit later. And then on the inside, we have this, the more typical nuclear reactor design. We have the, the pressure vessel, another steel vessel. Then we have the pressurizer steam generators that we saw move in in the previous diagram. And then at the bottom here, we have the core. And this is a, rend a 3D rendition of what the module will look like after we actually build it. A little bit more complicated. And that's really the core technology of our design, is, is the new scale power module. So what happens in our design instead of in typical reactors is we have the core here at the bottom and that heats up water surrounding the core. That water as it heats, it becomes less dense than the surrounding water and it rises and it rises through the riser. We're very creative at naming things. And it flows over the steam generator tubes. It reaches the pressurizer at the top and after it goes through the steam generators, it's really lost all of its all of its energy and it becomes cold again and as it becomes cold it becomes more dense and it falls down around the outside and continues and we have this natural circulation loop we only rely on gravity and physics to keep our reactor cool and going and by using this kind of natural circulation we're able to have a much smaller reactor. So only 60 megawatt electric, so that's about 1 20th of the operating fleet. And we, we, the standard design will have up to 12 of these modules in, within one site. And we would need about four plants to power all of the residential power needs of Oregon and about 10 to power all of the, even the industrial power needs and even electricity that we sell to other states, things like that. We'd be able to, to have all of that within just 10 plants. And so the other, the other benefit of having things so small, not only can we, can we have this natural circulation, but these are small enough to be built in a factory and then shipped to the site. So that means that we can build the other important structures on the site while we're manufacturing these modules and then drastically reduce the construction time. These modules are all independent within the plant, so they all have their own steam turbine and all have their own generator. They're all producing electricity on their own. And so that means that we're able to bring some offline for things like refueling and keep the rest going and always be generating electricity. And the operating fleet you typically have about a two month refueling outage where you're not producing any electricity at all. And we're able to, to continue with output because of multiple modules on site. Here, we call them small modular reactors, but they're pretty big compared to the average person. So we have this small average male American over here at five foot nine. And then we have the large reactor module it's about 76 feet tall, 15 feet in diameter. But to give a comparison and why we do call it small, this is what it looks like compared to a typical operating reactor. And so this is about 250 feet high. And you can fit nearly a thousand of our reactors inside of this volume here. And so it really is quite small compared to operating reactors. So we ha can have up to 12 of these modules on site and they're all housed in what we call the reactor building. And this is really where a lot of our resiliency and increased safety comes from. 
So besides the natural circulation and the removal of the, of the need for pumps to keep our core cool, we also have the modules partially submerged in this pool here. And then the building is also mostly underground. So we have the ground surface here and, it's, and this whole building itself is designed to be what's called seismic category one. And that just means it can really withstand extreme events. So it's able to shut down on pretty large earthquakes. This is where I should have prepared more. I can't tell you what on the Richter scale they can withstand. Um, I do know that it's about 0.8 Gs, but that's not very helpful. Um, and this, because this is seismic category one and very robust, it can withstand things like aircraft impacts and very high winds. So it can withstand missiles generated from tornadoes or hurricanes that are moving up to 220 miles per hour. So things like palm trees or anything like that. It's able to withstand impacts from that type of debris. And then on the top of the modules here, we, so we've got, the, we've got five modules here. One of them's missing. It's probably gonna get refueled. And these are all covered by a concrete shield called the bio shield. And that's just another barrier to the release. It's also there to make sure that any workers that need to be in the building, their radiation exposure is lower, that they're shielded from the modules by those. We also have a crane in the building itself. That's a very unique part of our design. Whereas in the operating fleet, when they refuel, they open the reactor where it is and they move each fuel piece individually we're moving the entire module at the same time. And we move it over to this little tool here, the refueling area, where we open the module and then we move the fuel to the spent fuel pool over here. So the reactor pool and the spent fuel pool, they're connected, but not completely. There's this little opening here. And then about 20 feet above the bottom of the pool, that's where they separate. And that's so that we can get this very large volume of water to cover both the modules and the pool for as long as we can. It's about 7 million gallons. It's pretty big. And so the, right in the refueling process, we'll open up the module over here. And that's when we'll perform inspections on any components in, inside the module, make sure that things are running as we expect them to. Any other system that's outside the module is designed to be maintained while online. And that's another unique aspect of our design. Most not most, but a lot of maintenance in the current fleet of reactors has to be done during refueling when you're not producing power. And then finally, to just really give you the dimensions of the building, we've got 10 foot thick concrete base here. There's a quarter inch thick steel lining this pool. And then the walls of the building itself are five feet thick. So it's very thick and very robust. Here's an overhead view. I spent a little bit too much time on the other one, but just to give you another perspective. So we could have all 12 modules here. We're moving the modules over here when we're refueling. We're keeping spent fuel here. And then eventually, as I'll talk about in the used fuel portion, we we'll move that to dry cast storage. And, um, and then we'll inspect the modules over here on this side when we're, when we're doing that refueling and maintenance. And then finally, the outer view of the site. So that reactor building was directly in the middle of the site here. The turbines are in these two outer buildings here. And those generate the electricity, push it to the switchyard there to go off site. And then this little portion right here, this little square, is where we would keep all of the used fuel for the entire 60 year lifetime of the plant from all 12 of the modules. And it's kind of hard to, to get a gauge for how big that is. This whole site's 34 acres. That's about four blocks, four city blocks. And that little portion there is about three basketball courts side by side. So you really do not generate that much, that much used fuel at, during the lifetime of the plant. And that's just because it's so dense. 
And here's a little diagram to show how it all fits together. So you got the modules, you're putting them in the, in the building, in the pool, and then it goes right into that middle part of the site there. So now that we've seen the modules in the pool and I've talked a little bit about our natural circulation and things like that, I'll go into a little bit more detail on other things that really separate us from designs as they exist today and, and allow us to really be safe. So our design is what we like to call walk away safe. So we don't need to, we don't rely on electricity to force that water over the core to keep it cool. We don't need extra water to do that. There's a large enough volume of water within the reactor itself and in the pool surrounding it for cooling. And, then, and that means we also don't need to rely on operators to add water to the pool. The only thing that needs to happen for us to safely shut down is for us to lose power, actually. So our system is designed to, be, to, to transfer to that safe state when we lose power. So an accident like what happened in Fukushima is a safe state for our design. We don't need those backup generators to keep that water moving. What'll happen is we'll bottle up the containment vessel. We have these valves on the outside of containment. They are held open by electricity. And so we'll move that power. They'll close. They're, they have uh, compressed air bottles attached to them that'll then force them closed when we're not holding them open anymore. And instead of transferring that heat to the steam generators out to the turbine, we will close that path to the turbine. And we have these little condensers on the outside of our containment here and that heat then goes directly to the pool. And so this is a unique aspect of nuclear technology in general. It's called decay heat. When you shut the reactor down, the, the reaction will slow, but heat is still generated within the core. It's like when you're driving your car and instead of applying the brakes, you just let go of the gas and you'll, you'll drift slowly to a stop, but we wanna be able to still steer so that we avoid collision and that's what our our safety systems here are doing. So in the back here, we have this decay heat power that happens when we shut the reactor down. At first, it's about 1 60th of our actual operating power, and it quickly drops. So we have here one second, one hour, one day. It really drops quite drastically in that amount of time. And then eventually it, it becomes stable. But in that initial, shut down, we need to be sure we can really remove that power. So with more natural circulation, we're, we'll put that steam out to these condensers and we'll get that heat out to the pool. Eventually, even with all 12 modules shut down, there will be so much heat in that 7 million gallon pool that it'll start to boil off. And that'll happen a little bit over a month. And then eventually, as that boils off, the, that core power will get so low that we don't need that water to remove the heat anymore. Only air cooling is okay. And that's what we mean by walk away safe. We lose power, we don't need operators to do anything. It'll just transfer to that safe position. And then the, the water in the reactor and outside the reactor will be everything that's necessary. And that increased safely, safety leads to, leads to reduced risk in our design. And this is really the, where I work in the company is, is in the probabilistic risk assessment. And that's where we look at the frequency of failure and the consequences of an accident. So to give a little background on what a PRA is, the risk assessment is, we can do one on our daily lives. So to get here today, I had to, I had to have a sequence of things work correctly. I had to be able to rely on my alarm to get me up on time. And if that didn't happen, hopefully I had a backup. But luckily I have roommates that also work with me, so they would have got me up too. So you got those backup systems. Then once I'm up, I need to make sure that I have a way to get to work. So I have this, my car, my roommate's car, the bus, any of those things working correctly, I can get to work. And then I need to be able to get my presentation from work, safely transfer it here so that I can be here. There's all kinds of steps to this process before the start of the day and me being here to present. And the PRA looks at all of those things where we start from a shutdown of the reactor 
And then we end up with, are we in a safe, coolable state or are we in core damage? And if we're in core damage, we look at how likely that is, what components do we rely on that fail to get us there? And where does that radioactivity go after an accident like that? And the result of the PRA is what's called the core damage frequency. So we try to estimate in what time span would we, um, would we expect to have a core damage event. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission goal for the United States is a core damage event once every 10,000 years. And a plant operates from anywhere from 40 to 60 years. So that really reduces the, uh, the likelihood of, of having that happen at all. And we'll see this on the left here. We've got the typical frequencies for the operating plant, for the operating fleets, anywhere from almost one in 10,000 to about one in a million years. And then we have advanced designs that go all the way down to maybe one in 10 million years. And then way down here, we have new scale about one in three billion years. And that's like an insane number to even think about. Uh, it's, it's so low. And that's just because at that point, we really need physics to break down. We need that water to stop being less and more dense and to stop flowing around in the reactor. And to show that we, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll table that. We have experiments where we have demonstrated that that's OK. Um, so not only do we rely on fewer systems and just physics in general to keep our reactor cool, but because we're so much smaller, the consequences of any accident that might happen are also dramatically reduced from operating reactors. So typically in an operating reactor, you have four barriers. You have the fuel itself, then you have a metal encasing around the fuel, and then you have the reactor pressure vessel, and then finally containment. And in the new scale design, we have even more barriers than that. We have this pool that we're in, the pool liner itself, the bio shield, and the reactor building. And these are all additional barriers to having a release at all. So how do we know that our reactor is going to operate the way that we say it does? There's a lot of things in our, in our design that are, that are new and that haven't been tested in the operating fleet. So we have a lot of, a lot of validation tests that we've done. The most, one of the most important ones is the new scale integrated systems test. And this is at Oregon State University. It's a one third scale design of the new scale module. And we've used that to validate our computer codes. So we have run accidents. It's, it's heated by an electrically heated core. So there's no, oops, there's no actual uh, nuclear material in the test reactor itself. But we've used that to look at shutting the reactor down, keeping that natural circulation going, and then, and then showing that our computer codes that we use to, to analyze this for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, that they're actually representing reality. So not only is there that one third scale test, but we've also needed to test other aspects of our design. The critical heat flux test is, is a core test that's making sure that we're able to cool the core enough. And then we have the helical coil steam generator. Our steam generators are a very unique design. They wrap around in a helix instead of being more of a straight through pipe. And so there are some, some things that we have to show with that, like that the water flowing over the outside of the pipes, it doesn't uh, vibrate them in a way that will wear them down faster. Uh, something that happened in the operating fleet in, in San Diego in the San Onofre generating station, they replaced their steam generators, but they degraded faster than they expected, and so they had to shut that plant down. And that's something that we need to look at ourselves. Another aspect of our design that's different is the control rods. So the control rods is what actually shuts the reactor down. And our control rods are much longer than the operating fleet because we have that pressurizer and we have the steam generators inside of our module. So we've done test control rod drop tests to show that they will actually fall into the core and not get stuck anywhere. 
And then steam generator flow induced vibration, I guess that's what I was actually talking about, that water flowing over the pipes and vibrating it and wearing them down. So we have, we have test facilities throughout uh, the United States and the world that have, that have undergone these tests to show that our design will operate how we expect it to. And not only that, we've also began building mock-ups of our module. So we have this upper module mock-up, and this is a full-scale mock-up to show that the orientation of different components on the top of the module, it's actually possible to fit them all there. Uh, it's kind of hard to visualize that when you're doing everything on paper, so it's important to, to really check yourself. And that's what we've done with this upper module mock-up. And this really helps us understand where can we move things, how do things fit together, will we be able to actually maintain what's on the top of the reactor. And this mock-up was fabricated at Oregon Ironworks, now Vigor, which is actually in Vancouver, Washington, uh, funnily enough. And that mock-up is now in Corvallis, and they periodically do, do tours. And, and that's you can, what you can see here is a little tour group going around the module, and that's about the upper one-third, and as you can see, it's really, the module is quite big. All right, shifting gears a little bit. So, talked about the design and the validation of the design, but what are some things that our design can actually do in terms of power generation and electricity that, the, that other forms of power generation really can't do? And this is a really hard to read slide, and I'm, I apologize about that. But we'll just hit the, we'll hit the high spots. So really, the important thing to know is that because we have these multiple modules, and they all are independently making heat and electricity, we're able to divert heat from some of those modules to do other things, like refine oil, produce hydrogen, or even desalinate water. And there's, there's studies that we've done with different national labs and, and other companies to, to really validate and show that this is a, something that can be done. I have a slide later about that. Um, and then something that really is important to think about is, is how well can we complement renewable energy? Renewable energy is really the thing that's on everyone's mind right now. And one of the weaker aspects of that is that the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine all the time. And we really don't have ways in our grid to store all that energy. And so what New Scale can do is we can ramp up production when the wind isn't blowing and the sun's not shining. And then we can bring that back down so that we can really match and, and follow what the renewable energy is producing and, and keep that grid stable. Because if you're really not able to meet, uh, to meet demand of, a, of uh, the, like the large scale grid and energy use, then the grid starts to become unstable. And then finally, we can use the plant to power what we call mission critical facilities, and that's things like hospitals, uh, Department of Defense, military bases, server farms for tech giants like Google. And because, again, because of the independent power generation, we're able to keep one module powering ourself and then really dedicate other modules to the specific facility, give any extra energy to the large scale grid. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. So right, it's important that we integrate with renewable energy. And, and to do that, you really have to follow their load because you're gonna really, you're gonna use the power that they generate first and foremost. And since we can control how much power we're producing, we'll follow that instead. And there's really three different areas that we can do that in the new scale design. First is just diverting steam away from the turbine completely. So we've got the reactor operating still. We divert steam from the turbine. It goes to that condenser and it becomes liquid water again. And we're not making electricity, but we're kind of wasting fuel a little bit. But we're able to do that very fast on the order of seconds. And so if we really need to down power for any reason to match the grid, we're able to do that almost immediately. But if there's gonna be more long-term need for reduced power, that's when we can start actually reducing the core power. And then if on the order of days, maybe weeks, if we know that, that there's gonna be a lot of power generation on the grid, we can even shut some of the modules down. And so we're able to really match the, 
renewable energy in these three different regimes here. This is a little bit more information on the cogeneration studies, so or refining oil and generating water and, and hydrogen. It's a little bit too much detail here, but the main point is, is that we can use some modules for these industrial processes and then we can use the other ones to generate electricity so we can power that facility, we can still power the grid, and we can also get these other useful products out of it. As I was talking about before, the, the design is, is very resilient. Most of that is because we don't rely on electricity to really cool our core, and the other part of that is the design of the plant itself, that robust, that robust building. And so there's really these six kind of different aspects of resiliency that we really like to point to for our design. The first one is black start in island mode. So what does that even mean? Um, black start is when we have this huge wide scale electrical grid outage and you, you need to restart that. And how you do that is you restart little portions at a time, bringing on generation sources at the same time so you can match that demand. And because of our ability to power ourselves, that's the island mode piece. So island mode, I guess I got a little ahead of myself. Island mode means that we can separate from the grid. Our reactors are so small that we can power anything inside of the plant that we need. You need electricity to produce electricity and we're able to do that ourselves. There was a plant, or one of the plants in the United States, uh, Palo Verde, was designed with this island mode in mind, but it was never licensed for, for use by the Re Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And so we would really be the first of a kind to be able to do that. And so what that means is we don't rely on the grid for our electricity. We're able to use it to produce it ourselves. And typically the operating reactors, they really need that electricity for their safety system. So they are the first things that you wanna give energy to in a, in a large scale blackout. But we can be that, that source, that, and that's also the first responder part of it. I don't know why these are two separate things. But we're able to give that electricity to the hospitals and to the other sources that need it right away because we don't need it ourselves and we're able to give it to them. Then we're, we're able to resist natural events and aircraft impacts. So that's that hurricane force winds and the tornado missiles. So those palm trees hitting our plant, it's, we're, gonna be, we're gonna be able to withstand that. And then an in interesting aspect is cybersecurity. So everything seems to be connected to the internet these days. Uh, in, in operating plants in the United States, you're not gonna connect anything that's important to the internet, you have internal networks. But another thing that's, that may be worrisome is, well, maybe somebody can get access to that. In our design, we use what's called field programmable gate arrays. And that's a fancy term for something that you have to go physically to its location to be able to change what it's doing. There, you cannot, it does not use microprocessors. You can't use software or a virus to go in there and change what it's doing. You have to go physically connect and interact with it. And so our whole safety system premise is based on this field programmable gate array design. And, and then really, if somehow one of those were to fail, what would happen is that we would just then lose power to any of our components. It would go into that safe spot and it would just shut down. And so any, we really just move to that safe state whenever we need to. And then finally, something that we really don't think about is electromagnetic pulse. So what if we really do have that solar flare and it knocks out of our, our electric grid? Will we have things that are able to produce electricity quickly again, and our design is able to do that. Uh, we have a, on our, on, the, on our website, there's a study that we did with Oregon State University to show that our design, if we were able to, we can cover up some of these penetrations outside the building, that's pretty easy to do, and once we do that, we're able to, to resist these solar flare type events and even even events from a detonation of a nuclear weapon in the atmosphere, that electromagnetic pulse, we can withstand that. And let's see, I think I'll skip, okay. So why don't we stop here and, and when we come back, I'll talk about the fuel cycle and, and use fuel and things like that. I'm sure people have questions about that. How do,
All right. Yeah, it looks like you have a question, sir. We wait oh. until the microphone comes. Oh, microphone. Through. Okay. Oh, all right. <laughs> I'm first. Yeah, go for it. Um, I lived in Idaho Falls. My husband worked for the atomic energy testing there on the site, uh, the desert. Um, my question is, at that time, many years ago, of course, uh, it was uh, nuclear testing. Are you looking to provide power to southern Idaho through what you're going to be putting out there? Yes, we are. So later on, I'll get to talking about that first installation, but just a real quick. Uh, yeah, so the first plant is going to be on the Idaho National Lab site. There's going to be an agreement with the Department of Energy for them to use two of the modules, one to power Idaho National Lab and the other one to do some heat generation experiments. And then the other 10 will be controlled by the Utah Associated Municipal Power System. And that they provide electricity to the Northwest. So Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Nevada. Um, so yeah, that, that is the goal is that we will be having that plant there. It'll be supplying energy to us and it'll be operated by Energy Northwest who currently operates the Columbia Generating Station reactor in Southern Washington. Hi, uh, my name is Roz. Uh, it seems the challenge of uh, expanding nuclear power generation is how to safely and permanently store spent fuel, uh, which I thought required tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years. So has that problem been solved? And uh, of the 60-year operating life of a plant where you'd store the spent fuel on site, what, what do you plan to do with the spent fuel after that? Right. So, yeah, those are, those are good questions. I guess we'll jump ahead real quick. So there, here's a, kind of the answers to both parts of your question. Uh, to, to, to start off, there's really not, there, there are technical solutions to what to do with used fuel. And really the problem is political. You can, in the United States, we can't recycle fuel. It is, it is illegal to do that. A lot of countries in the world do that. There is a lot of energy still left in the fuel, about 96% when we're done with it. It's just not in a configuration that we can really use it as it is. But there are designs coming out where you're able to actually take this used fuel as it is and put it in their reactors and it will continue to use it. Um, there is what's called the closed fuel cycle. So you can use reactors to actually produce more fuel and in that process it would consume this used fuel. Those are called breeder reactors but the reason that we don't use those is because they produce plutonium and that's very easy to extract and for non-proliferation reasons you don't want to be able to really get that out of there and produce, and produce a lot of nuclear weapons. So that's why we've tend to avoided those things. But and then eventually if we can get fusion reactors working, you can do what's called a blanket reactor. So you can take this used fuel as it is and you can just put it outside the fusion reactor and it will actually burn it up and make it a lot less toxic. So, so you're right, in, in the way that it is now, if we just take this fuel, we put it in these dry casks and then we store it underground eventually, it will take hundreds of thousands of years to decay to a safe state. But there are a lot of ways that we can use it as it is. It, it would really be a waste to do that, in my opinion. Um, there's so many ways that we can still get energy out of this and really make it less toxic to us at the same time. Good morning, this is uh, Eric. And I understand that uh, many of the older nuclear reactors, such as the Beaver Valley One reactor in Pennsylvania, were designed with not only a uh, pressurized water system to cool the core, but as a backup had a uh, safety injection piping system that would inject water into the core in the event of an earthquake or some type of event, event such as that. Do I understand one advantage of your design is that it eliminates those pressurized water systems altogether uh, to cool the core? Yes, that's true. And this will be a little bit easier with this diagram here, Pff, way back. Whew, okay, 
So yeah, the, the way that we've eliminated that is one of our safety systems, the emergency core cooling system in our design is just valves. And they are valves on the top and right above the core on this pressurized, on the internal vessel here. And there's so much water within this inner vessel that if we were to have a break into containment where we're losing water out here, eventually these valves would open. And they either open by us, by them losing electricity like, we, like I've talked about before, or eventually on low enough pressure they'll open themselves. So this is very high pressure in here. This is a vacuum in this little area there. And eventually the, the valves will open themselves. And so what that'll do is it'll take all this, this water that normally you would just lose outside of the reactor and that's where you need that safety injection system. We'll just recirculate it right back in and make sure that, it, that the core is covered. Um, and, and it's really simple for us to do that in our design. Another thing is, so what if we lose water outside of containment? That's the next logical question. Well, all of our valves that we need to close the containment off, they are directly attached to the vessel here. And in operating designs, there's a little bit of space between the isolation and the containment itself where you could have a break that you, that you can't isolate. But in our design, you would have to physically damage the valves somehow. And they are within a steel body. There's two of them. Um, it, it's just very, that, that part of the, you know, it's really much easier to and safer to operate valves that can just move to one position and stay there than it is to keep forcing water through. And so that's how we've eliminated that. Hi. Good morning. My name is Bob. Um, what is the, how do you protect the uh, wall of the reactor core and the pressure vessel from the radiation which can split atoms itself? There must be some way to uh, insulate the wall of the reactor. Is it carbon rods or what? Yeah, so there is a reflector that surrounds the core and that's so, right, we can refocus as many neutrons as we can back into the core to facilitate the reaction. But what'll happen is neutron activation. So these outer vessels, they will absorb the neutrons that we can't redirect or won't be, get captured in the reflector. And that does cause what's called neutron embrittlement. And so we have in our design specifications to, we've designed the module to these thicknesses and for these lifespans where we know based on the operating fleet. So this is one area where we can really utilize that 50 or 60 years of experience with similar pressure vessels to, to show that we have sufficiently designed the reactor to withstand that. And if for some reason uh, it does become too brittle or things like that, we would just be able to every, in, in our really refueling outages that happen every two years, we could realize that and shut the plant and shut that module down and perhaps get a new one or just leave it as it is for the rest of the, for the rest of the lifetime. But that is something that's explicitly considered in the design from day one is the embrittlement of the pressure vessel. Hi, uh, this is Danny. Um, I worked for the Tennessee Valley Authority, the regional power authority in Southeast in the 1980s and 1990s. And uh, nuclear power almost did the, uh, the agency in. It was planning to build 17 nuclear units. It only finished nine. One of the units was begun in 1970s and was finished in 2016. I yeah, I was at the Brown Ferry. Beckett's <laughs> as the longest running construction project. So, so you, have, um, you have this legacy, yeah. public skepticism, enormous expense. You said your investment of $850 million in nuclear power in your, in your company over the last decade. And you also have liability issues about uh, covering the possibility of, a, of an accident. Nobody wants that, show, no private company wants that uh, responsibility. So my question is, is this really a technical problem or is it a public perception and confidence problem and an economic problem? So regardless of what the technology can or cannot do, are you facing enormous obstacles in terms of public acceptance and uh, financial responsibility? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So yes, the, the public perception really is one of the biggest things against nuclear power. And I can stand up here all day and tell you how safe it is. And that really, that doesn't mean too much in general. I mean, we can walk through how, how much it's different. I think that really opened my eyes because I too was skeptic before I really got into the nuclear science program. But to really drill down to your question, um, yeah, cost overruns have been a huge thing. And in, right now in South Carolina, they've been building two newer design AP1000s for, since 2009, and they were supposed to be done three years ago. And they're still projected to, to take a couple more years at that. They even bankrupted uh, Westinghouse. And that, that project right now is at $15 billion. That's an insane amount of money. No company can really finance that itself. So with our design, because the really how we're tackling that is this manufacturing process. So being able to make them smaller, we can build, we can get that economy of scale instead of it being building huge reactors like we've done in the past, we can now build many of them much more quickly while also building the plant infrastructure on the site. And trying to get those two things done at the same time really impacts the schedule in terms of if you're constructing the actual nuclear vessel and things on the site and you're trying to construct all the concrete buildings and things like that, it's gonna, it takes a long time. And I have a slide about this a little bit later, but for comparison, our plant cost with this manufacturing, our, our estimates are, the first one will cost about $3 billion. That's still a lot of money. But it's for about three quarters of the electricity that you get from the operating plants one-fifth the cost, that's pretty good. And we're still looking at other things we can do to, to bring that cost down further. But the, the cost behind safety, cost is like one of, the, one of the things that's on our minds. Okay, I think we need a break just so we can absorb everything you've already said. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sorry, I was getting thing. carried away. Take 10 minutes, please. All right, so we'll dive right back in here with the fuel cycle. And this is where we'll talk a little bit more about the used fuel. It's definitely something that's always on people's minds. So just I'll give a, a quick overview of, of the cycle itself. And this is another slide I should have kind of piecemealed and blown up a little bit. But we'll just follow the numbers here. So step one here on the left, we mine uranium. And there's some mines in the United States, but most of the mines that are operating in the world today are, are in China. We mine what's called the yellow cake uranium. It's yellow. Again, we're very creative with naming things. Then that is converted to a gas. And that gas is what's transferred in step two and then enriched in step three. So enrichment is very important to having fuel that's usable in reactors. So that gas is put in centrifuges. That's why it was important that the centrifuges in Iran were damaged or, or brought down a number because that's how you bring the fuel up to enrichment. And what that does is because there's only one weight of uranium that we're interested in. The rest of it, so naturally occurring uranium, about 0.7% of it is in, the, is in the usable form that we need. And that's a lighter form than the rest, the other 99% of the uranium. And so if you spin that in a centrifuge enough, you'll really get that light uranium out. You keep doing that, and eventually uh, you'll end up with this lighter uranium that we need. And so that enriched uranium then is converted into the solid fuel bundles, and that's what's in step four there. And th that solid fuel is then transferred to the plants, and then we're finally generating electricity. Then after that, after we've used that fuel as much as we can without doing anything further to it, we transfer it to the spent fuel pool, the, this underground, underwater pool here, number six. And that's because of this decay heat aspect. We still have the, the fuel is actually thermally hot, so we need to cool it down. And it stays there for, another, for about five to seven years before we move it to dry cast storage or we're able to do something else with it. 
So after that five to 10 years, we would move to step seven, reprocessing. This is where we could recycle it and move from seven back to four, but that's illegal in the United States. So instead, we would put this fuel into a glass form. It's called vitrification. And that form is then placed into casks or underground in, uh, in step nine there. And that would be like your Yucca Mountain repository. So at the new scale plant, really, how do we do this? Well, we, we have this refueling process I was talk to, talking about earlier. So we open the modules up, we move the fuel over, this is the spent fuel pool, and then it sits there for five to seven years. Um, and in there, it's protected by this robust building and by the ground. And, and this is a picture of an actual spent fuel pool. But the, the fuel is designed so that the, the, uh, the fuel is far enough apart that we can't have this self-sustaining reaction like we do in the reactor. And then after we cool it in the spent fuel pool, that's when we put it into these casks. And these casks, they, these have been in use for, for quite a while now. This is really until we can figure out some political way to, to really get around this. I mean, I, you know, nobody wants the fuel in their own backyard and so Nevada with no reactors is like, why are you gonna put this here? Um, and, and so in the meantime, we have these, these dry casks and they're, they're pretty large. Uh, you, can, you can see the scale of people here working on them. These are NRC inspectors. And these are steel containers with the fuel inside and then we've got the concrete shell on the outside. And these are all stored at the plant site and ultimately, the Department of Energy has the responsibility by law. They are the ones that own this fuel after it's used. And until they can decide to put it in Yucca Mountain or recycle it or things like that, uh, it'll be on the plant site until decommissioning when they'll either break down the rest of the reactor and unfortunately still keep the used fuel and cast there, or they'll move them to a different site before finally storing them underground. And I briefly mentioned recycling. I mean, that is something we could do. A lot of countries in the world do that. France, 80% of its energy comes from nuclear power and they recycle quite a bit of their fuel. And beyond just saving uh, or reducing the amount of mining that we have to do, it really reduces the volume of that waste. This used fuel is called high level waste. Uh, and we could really reduce the toxicity of that by about 90%. So instead of 100,000 years of waiting, uh, it would still take 1,000, but not quite as long. Uh, we could also burn it up in, in new style reactors or blanket in the fission reactor, things like that. One of my favorite solutions from the early 60s was to launch it into the sun, um, but it's very expensive to put that on a rocket. And you know, we've, we don't want, any of that getting out, so. Yeah, I mean, I guess I covered all of that. I'm, I'm sorry, I thought there was more here on news fuel, but that really is, is the story of it, is there's a lot of options. We could, there's a lot of designs where we could still use this fuel and we could recycle it and things like that, but we've, for one reason or another, made those things illegal in the United States. And so for right now, what we do is we store it on site until the Department of Energy can decide what to do with it. So earlier I mentioned $850 million of investment and that all, all of that cost comes even before we've built any of our modules at all. That is to get our design licensed in the United States. And to do that, we have a design certification application. We completed that in December of 2016 and when you submit something like that to the, to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, I mean, this is a large document. It's 12,000 pages. And then beyond that, there's 14 other reports that are hundreds of pages, each describing in more detail some of our new methods or new aspects of the design that we really wanted to get the NRC's second look on and, and approval. Two million hours went into this and over 800 people. And we also had contractors and other suppliers working with us. And, and like I mentioned, so over 500 million was put just into submitting it. And we still have a ways to go. 
there are five phases of the review and we're in phase four right now. So we've gone through a lot of stages of, of licensing. The, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has looked at our document. They've come in to our offices and talked to us and looked at our actual internal documents, which are many more thousands of pages and more detailed than the design certification. And for each chapter of the design certification, so there's specific parts you have to look at, the plant level design, the vessel, the different safety systems, the probabilistic risk assessment is its own chapter. There are specific reviewers at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. They each review the chapters, they ask more questions if they need to, and then they write a safety evaluation report. And so being at this phase means that there are most of these safety evaluation reports are final and approved, that they have agreed that our design is safe. And to finally, like the, the last aspect of the licensing process is getting it written into law. The Code of Federal Regulations, it, it will actually be in that regulation that states this design has been deemed safe by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and can be licensed and operated. And so the next step after getting our general design approved, ooh, that's a little sneak peek. Um, so that part is for our general design. And then of course we cite these at actual locations in the United States. And so there's a separate license that goes into that. Uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority actually just uh, is in the final stages of approval for an early site permit. That's where they license the site specifically and they don't have a reactor design chosen. So we could use the design certification and the early site permit and then finally get a construction and operating license that uses both of those. And that's when you can actually build and operate the plant at a site. Emergency planning zone. So in an accident situation, there would need to be ordered evacuation. So you have this, currently it's 10 miles in radius. That's a pretty large circle. And that's where you do these, these drills. You have the sirens. Uh, about once a year you do these drills to make sure that if we need to evacuate people are ready, they understand where they need to go. And because of our, the, the really reduced risk in our design and the smaller size in general, we are working with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to understand if we can reduce the size of that planning zone. Is there a distance that's less than 10 miles where we can guarantee the same level of protection that that 10 mile planning zone does. And the first person to really attempt this is the Tennessee Valley Authority. And in their early site permit, they had provisions for smaller emergency planning zones. One that's about two miles and one that's at the site boundary. So there would not be any ordered evacuation off site. And that doesn't mean there's no plans at all. If we have the emergency planning zone at the site boundary, that just means that we take advantage of the all hazard plans that are put in place by the state and local governments and the federal emergency management agency to address things like hurricanes and earthquakes and things like that, that we're able to show the risk from the nuclear plant is much less than all of those and that those plans are sufficient to get people out and protect them in the same way as the 10 mile emergency planning zone. And so there was an analysis that was done at the Clinch River site in Tennessee, and this is by Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And because Tennessee Valley Authority hasn't chosen a design, uh, New Scale is one of the designs that they're looking at. And so we participated in this analysis with them to show that if we had a, a New Scale plant at, at that site, that the radiation dose is limited to the site boundary. And the NRC reviewed their, their early site permit and even came and, and looked at our actual detailed analysis. And they agreed that this is feasible. They have not approved this yet. They agreed that if it can be demonstrated with a design that Tennessee Valley has chosen, that it is feasible to provide this same level of protection with a smaller distance. Another thing that's, that's different in our design that, that was part of the licensing process, and I just want to be clear too, the emergency planning zone sizing, 
that's still something that's being worked on with the NRC. Um, we have a method that we're trying to, to get the NRC to agree is safe, and we've been working with them for the last couple of years. It mirrors the, the original method they used to come up with 10 miles. And so we've been working back and forth with them to, to get to a point where they can, they can say it's reasonably safe. And that, is, that, that will come after our design certification, but before we get that construction and operating license. So different, another different aspect of our design is operator staffing. So we have a completely different control room design than the operating fleet does. And in the Code of Federal Regulations, there is a table that shows for the plants in the United States it's a three by three table because in the United States, the most plants you have on the same site is three. And so it shows if you have three con one to three control rooms or one to three reactors, and if you fall somewhere on that table, how many operators do you need to be able to safely control that site? And because 12 is definitely much bigger than three, we had to be able to show the NRC that we are able to, to safely control all of these 12 reactors from, from one control room. And we did that using what's called an integrated system validation test. And we did that with our full scale simulator that's at the Corvallis site. And so what we did here is we trained about 11 different crews of operators over many weeks, over all aspects of the design. And then there were 12 full scope uh, accident scenarios that were then uh, completed over 11 weeks and then finally after all that training the Nuclear Regulatory Commission came and viewed the operators working through these scenarios and they they agreed that we can operate our plant with instead of as many as 10 for just three reactors that with six licensed operators we're able to control all 12 reactors. I mentioned before the aspect of factory. Oh, I actually do want to go back. So I did have a question during the break about about the uh, the operators and and the costs here. And so uh, there will be six uh, nuclear engineers that are licensed by the NRC. That that license operating process, they do actually have to uh, work on a on a reactor or a simulator that represents the actual thing. And so at Oregon State University, they do have reactor operating classes where for that research reactor on site, they have people go in, they can become licensed. And that is a, that's a stepping stone to our licensing or our operator licenses. And so to help with that, to kind of further that idea, we have been working with the Department of Energy and some universities to build more of these simulators to start training the next generation of operators while they're still in school. And I can't remember what the three different universities are, but there will be three in the United States where that will have these full scale simulators where we can start getting uh, the, next, the next generation of staffing ready. And so the, yeah, this six is, is just, it's dramatically reduced from if we extended that three by three table I've heard anywhere from 20 to 100 people that we would need. Um, and so going through this process and actually having the Nuclear Regulatory Commission there watching these people go through this, um, it, it was really a huge, uh, a huge step for New Scale. So another aspect with really, we had this question about, about costs earlier, and this is where the fabric, factory fabrication comes in. This really allows us to build, to take advantage of the mass production aspect to drive down the cost. And that allows us to reduce the schedule by building the on-site uh, infrastructure while we're also producing the modules. And as something that also helps drive down that cost is that because all these modules are independent of each other, once we have them installed in the site one at a time, they can start producing electricity right then. And uh, that, that energy company can start bringing in that revenue from producing electricity right away. 
And to really demonstrate and show that this is possible, New Scale has begun working with some different manufacturing companies. So in 2018, BWX Technologies, a company in the eastern United States, they were selected to, to help us uh, improve our design for manufacturability for our smaller components. So things like the valves and the vessel internals and other things like that, so kind of the smaller pieces uh, that we needed to, to build offsite and then bring, bring for final installation. And then in 2019, Doosan Heavy Industries began working with New Scale and, and they would manufacture the actual vessels themselves. So there are not that many places in the world that can manufacture a vessel, a steel vessel as large as what's needed in the New Scale design. And even, even though that were small, I mean, that's still the case. And because we haven't been building reactors in the United States for quite a while, um, besides the, the few that are in construction in, in South Carolina, uh, we really don't have that capacity in the United States anymore to be able to build these, these large vessels. So hopefully we can bring those jobs back in the future with this manufacturing process. But as of right now, we're, we're working with Doosan Heavy Industries, which has experience and forges necessary to build these large vessels. And they would be more focused on our international, uh, on more international customers, but, but still until we can get the United States capability up again, uh, we need that. We need that outside help. And so the first manufacturing trials are planned for next year. Um, we really need to start doing that if we want to, to be able to keep our timeline for 2026. And this comes back to, to the economics again. The, I have a figure here, the level S cost of electricity. Uh, that's not really hugely helpful for just thinking about the, our target is $65 per megawatt hour. So what this value means is over the, the lifespan of the facility through construction and operation costs and all those things, how much based on the electricity generated did it cost to make that electricity? And this, is, this, this value is competitive with natural gas, but there are still things that we need to do to drive it lower. And, even, and, and soon, uh, solar energy will also become one of the cheapest forms of energy as well. And so getting this levelized cost down is important. But then we also have those overnight costs, like I'd mentioned. So that first plant to actually build it, our estimate is $3 billion. And as we get, uh, as we learn lessons from that, and as we get this manufacturing process up to speed, the next plants will be about $2.5 billion. So compared to large plants, that's, that's pretty cheap. But, but like we said, um, that's still, that's a large number. And that's something that we're definitely thinking about and working on. So beyond, beyond just the technology itself, uh, we, there has to be interest outside and in customers in the industry. And, and New Scale is engaged with, with the electricity companies in the United States and, and some in Canada to, to really get their feedback on what, what do they need. And you know, schedule and cost, definitely one of the biggest things. And so we've been working with them since we formed the New Scale Advisory Board in 2008. And originally there was only eight utilities that uh, participated, but, but now we have a, up to over 29. And, and this board meets about twice a year. And this is, yeah, where we really take the opportunity to, to give them updates on our progress and then understand really what they need. And so you'll see some companies here like Portland General Electric, um, Idaho Power, uh, and, then, and then also people that have operated plants in the United States for quite a while, like Tennessee Valley Authority and Energy Northwest, and even Duke Energy all the way down here. And so we're getting this, this feedback from all these people to really make sure uh, that, that we get this right. Now an aspect of, of the economics that I kind of put this out of place, but that we really haven't talked much about yet is, is one, of the, one of the major ideas and something that we want to do with the new scale plant is replace the existing coal plants that, that will be getting uh, retired as our climate goals get more and more stringent. 
And our first customer, the Utah Associated Municipal Power Systems, that's, that's why they are looking at new scale is because they are going to be retiring coal plants and they need that energy, the energy generation. And so because of our plant's small footprint, we're able to, to place our plants actually on, the, on these coal sites already as they are. And we can utilize that infrastructure and bring the cost down even more. And that co those savings could be as much as 100 million. And uh, any, any dollar counts when you're talking about billions. And what's important about this is that you're not losing those jobs from that, from that coal plant. You're not replacing those people completely because a lot of areas of power production are similar. We're able to retrain a lot of the staff from these coal plants to, to do similar jobs at a nuclear power plant. And then finally, this is my last slide. Thank you for bearing with me. The first deployment will be this UAMPS carbon free power project. And so as I've mentioned, this will be at the Idaho National Labs. It'll be a full 12 module plant. Uh, we're gonna, it's slated for, for operation in 2026. And so far we're on track to do that with our, with our progress and licensing. And, and they've begun uh, the first site selection at Idaho National Labs. And so soon we'll be putting together that operating and construction license permit for review by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, but it, something important to note is that the Department of Energy is very interested in this because they own the I, Idaho National Lab site. And the Idaho National Labs is, one of, is the densest uh, place of nuclear reactors in the entire world. Uh, last I heard there were 54 reactors on the site. Uh, that's quite a few. And so they're excited to have a, one, a newer design there that they can, that they can work with. And that'll be through the Joint Use Modular Plant Program, JUMP. And it, through this program, the Department of Energy will be leasing two of the modules. One of them will go to, pow to producing electricity to power Idaho National Lab. And then the other one will be for uh, departments, I mean, for experiments that are funded by the Department of Energy. And with that, I'll, I'll go to close. The future of energy is here. We're smaller, we're safer, we're scalable, and we're just right around the corner. So I, thank you so much for, for coming and listening. <laughs> Take some more questions. This is Lucy. Um, question, how many other companies are looking at the, are tr developing these smaller scale type of projects? I don't know the number off the top of my head, but uh, in the United States, there are a few. Uh, we're the only one that's currently being through in the licensing process with, with the Reg Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, but there are other reactor designs like TerraPower, in Washington, that's the project that's funded by Bill Gates, and they're a completely different fuel design, um, and they're quite a quite a few years out. And there's a company that's in uh, that's in Southern California that's working on a, a similar small modular design, but I can't remember the, the name of it <laughs> right now. And then there was a BWX that's actually working with us now. They were one of the one of the first, they were with New Scale in, in beginning that design, that wave of small modular reactors. And they were, they actually won the first Department of Energy grant. Um, but they have since lost steam and they, and now we're, we're combining forces. And, and the last, the last one that, uh, that I can think of is, is called Holtec, um, Holtec's SMR. And they have kind of a similar design to ours, except for that the steam generator is a second vessel that's like attached at the same time. It's kind of interesting to think about. But so yeah, there, there are a couple companies in the United States and then throughout the world, uh, Rolls-Royce in England just announced that they're starting development on small modular reactors. And then there's some French companies that are, that are working on it as well. And then um, not too long ago, Russia announced that they had a small reactor on a on a barge, like actually a floating reactor that they'd put into operation. So there's quite a few quite a few designs and companies up there. 
Uh, my name is Sally. Um, now, you said the very first step is the mining of uranium. I missed, do you actually mine uranium or a rock that has uranium in it? I don't understand. Um, very basic question, probably. Yeah, you do mine uranium, and it's in this cakey yellow form. And so that's, that's what you get out of the mining process is this actual uh, uranium oxygen mixture that's in that we then need to place into other forms to use but it is directly uranium that we're that we're mining over here this is linda can you tell me why recycling the spent fuel is illegal in the u.s i can't tell you why it's against the law i i want to say it's for non-proliferation reasons um, because it, even in the standard plants that operate in the united states they do produce some plutonium and it would be relatively straightforward to get that, to extract that in the recycling process. And, and so I'm not 100% sure, but that would be my guess as to why it's, why it's illegal. Hi, I have another simple question, which is you have the yellow cake and then you have to turn it into a form that's usable that's gonna produce a neutron. How does that happen? Yeah, so how do we even start the reaction? Yes. Yeah. So in the core, we, it's actually, so after we make the fuel rods and we build the core and it's in the shape that we want it to be usable in, um, we actually have something else inside the core called startup neutron sources. And these are not uranium. These are things like uh, californium, or I, it's a longer name than that, but the, there's these natural, there's these elements that will naturally split on their own and giving off neutrons. And so we have some fuel assemblies in the core, those fuel rods, they have this neutron source in it to get the reaction started. And then once we have the reaction going, and this is on when we first start the reactor, um, we will withdraw those fuel rods at the first refueling. And there will be other spots in the fuel that are neutron activated. So once that reaction's already going, then some of these fuel rods will absorb these other neutrons and they'll be our startup sources later. And, and so yeah, the reaction doesn't just start from, from uranium. The core is designed so that we don't get that critical reaction uh, without additional sources. This is Wes. I'm old hat, but I heard you say something about water to begin with and I've never heard anything else since then. About water? <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I want good water out of those plants, not junk. And where do you store it, and where does it go, and that type of thing. Right, so I guess to clarify, do you, are you talking about the water that's in the reactor, or desalination, any of that? Doesn't matter. Yeah, so, Right, I mean, there's a substantial amount of water that we just use in the reactor, right? I mean, seven million gallons in the pool itself. And so that, um, we really need to have like large agreements with the local, local land, like uh, Idaho National Labs. I mean, we have to get water right, rights agreements with some of the local tribes there and some of the local municipalities. But at this point, the actual desalination process is just something that we've shown on paper can be done but we don't have plans right now to build plants next to a desalination plant or anything like that. That's sometime in the future. Um, but yeah, in terms, of, in terms of storing that water, I'm not sure. But the, the water that we get on, on site, you know, we'll, we recirculate and reuse the majority of that water, the vast majority. My name is David. Uh, do you have many patents for this organization and how is it going to be financed? Yeah, we have almost 500 patents on our technology. I mean, that's primarily our value at this point because we haven't produced a plant yet or started producing electricity. And so our primary, you know, the, our primary investors right now are, are companies that are interested in building these things like Fluor. So Fluor is, was our first investor and they would like to build the actual site. They want to build the buildings and the infrastructure. 
and then BWXT wants to build the components and Doosan wants to build the module itself. Uh, that's where our, our uh, investment is coming from. But in terms of actually building these things, that's up to the power companies it's, themselves. So UAMPs, they're currently going in this process of, of trying to get this plan out the Idaho National Lab. They went around to their local municipalities and, and got power purchase agreements from all of them saying that they will, they will use this much electricity or they will buy this much from the plan. And that's really, that's really the step for them is that the power uh, utilities, they, they invest in the project and building the project themselves. And whereas uh, the design and other aspects, uh, that's a separate investment. Hi, my name is Jeanette, and thank you for this interesting presentation. I appreciate when people are looking for ways to solve our energy needs. <clears throat> However, I have some concerns, and I'm wondering, I'd like to play the devil's advocate. Please. And hear what you have to say. So the history of nuclear power is one of mis misleading information and uncertainty. I mean, telling people they were safe when they weren't. <clears throat> and maybe they didn't know. <coughs> I understand that the, in the treatment, a use of water uh, in cooling these ultimately affects the temperature of rivers and is a concern for the health of um, fish or the, the, the health of the river. You talked about uh, building something that's good for 60 years and, and it seems like whatever we do we have to plan for a, a thousand or four thousand. I mean that seems like a short time span and they still haven't cleaned up the existing fuel. Yucca Mountain isn't considered safe enough, and no other place has been found. Um, so, and, and a question I have in relationship to that is all the money that's been spent on this, how much, do you have any idea how much solar or wind power um, could be developed for the same amount of money I don't I don't have a, an, an answer to that unfortunately that's a great question um, yeah I mean solar is probably as of this year the cheapest form of energy to build and I have no idea how much you could build with three billion dollars instead of instead of this instead of the new scale plant I mean the real the real counter to that is just the size of that farm I mean we're talking about what do we do to the environment and to like rivers and things like that so on the new scale design we would air cool we would use air cooling towers instead of necessarily putting heat into rivers but because of only a 34 acre footprint i mean we saw that it took 33 million solar panels to get the same amount of energy that's a huge amount of land i mean you're really upsetting a lot of it you're, there's a different environmental consideration instead of just what carbon are you producing? There is, what, how are we just disrupting all this, this wide swath of land that we need for all these solar panels? And so, I mean, that's, that would be my response to that. But in terms of how much it would cost, I really don't know. Hi. This is Dave. Um, I thought Jeanette was gonna ask my question, but then she didn't. Um, so back to water, uh, you talked about uh, using water from, uh, uh, I assume, a water source, a river or a stream to cool, to use for cooling. And uh, can you address that? That's been one of the major criticisms of nuclear power plants historically, besides the disposing of the waste, is that it does change the ecology of a river or a stream. They have to be placed near a river or a stream um, to have some kind of a cool water source to cool down the plant, but that raises the temperature of the water. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And in our, in the new scale design, we don't need to be sited next to a river because of how small our reactors are, we're able to, to air cool them. Um, so we don't need to have that, like way back when in the beginning, there was this third loop of cooling 
And that's where you would go to the river. Let's see. We okay. So yeah, this would be this cooling into the river, or the ocean, like you were talking about. But in the new scale design, we would have air cooling here instead. I mean, we still need a lot of water to operate the plant, but that would be largely a one-time, uh, you know, investment. We would just need that that initial water to fill the pool to get the modules going. Um, but then beyond that, we have all these these closed loops uh, where we just reuse water as much as we can. Okay, sorry. Oh, okay. I'm Jackie, and my question is, how do you protect your financial sources from corruption? And I heard this was a problem some years ago, a major problem for your company. Right, yes. One of our first investors... Uh, we got investigated by the SEC. Um, we had some shell companies investing in us. But since then, um, you know, I don't have a, gr I don't really don't have a great answer for you. That's kind of above my pay grade. But what, I, you know, we just, we have these, now we, we rely a lot more on, you know, floor, these, these companies that have an interest in actually seeing us succeed and not siphoning money off of us. You know, Floor wants to build these, Doosan wants to build these, the Department of Energy, they want these plants at their sites. And so I think there's some self-regulation there. I'm not aware of anything that's in place, but that, yeah, that'd definitely be above me. This is Bill. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, it seems as if historically the major problems with nuclear plants have been the large-scale ones. And yet at the same time, we've had what at least from my perception has been fair success with the type of nuclear reactors that have been on aircraft carriers and submarines. How do those differ? That's a great question. And unfortunately, that's also one I don't know much about. Um, I mean, they are smaller designs, they are pressurized water reactors, but in terms of how much dif more different they are from us compared to operating reactors, I couldn't tell you. Um, I mean, beyond just forcing that circulation and needing those active electrically powered safety systems, I'm not sure the details of how much they are different. They are horizontal, I mean, that's a big that's a big difference compared to our design, but, but yeah, unfortunately, I don't know much about that. This is Deanna. I'm curious to know about the relationship between uh, R&D plants and uh, the universities. A couple of sub-questions. Is nuclear engineering uh, commonly offered in uh, major U.S. universities and um, with your research plant right there in Corvallis, what's the uh, relationship? Is new scale what's being taught? Just if you could speak about that, please. Yeah, yeah um, nuclear engineering is one of the common engineering disciplines that are taught at universities throughout the country. I'm not sure if it's at, you know, everyone like mechanical engineering or electrical engineering is, but there definitely are quite a few out there. And at least from my own experience at Oregon State, New Scale was more of a kind of just a, a whisper you heard in the halls. They didn't really teach that at all in, in the classes. What we, what we got was was really the the basics of it. So, you know, what is what is fission? How do we determine how much energy we're getting? What shape do we have to put the do we have to put uranium in to to have the reaction go? Things like that. So it's really much more of a general. This is how you would make electricity um, from a plant, and not any specific design. Um, there's not that. There's not really that indoctrination there. There's just this. Here's the general. You know, and you get the tools, and then, and then once you get out there, you have to choose how you apply them. 
Oh, um, Paul here. The costs of even applying are somewhat mind-boggling in the time, and time is always money. So uh, in other countries, you say France has 80% of their energy uh, generated by nuclear facilities. Is there other parts of the world where you could present a design like this and not have to go through quite so many hoops and hurdles? Um, a lot of the nuclear... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A lot of the countries in the world that use nuclear power, I mean, they have similar regulatory structures to ours. Uh, it's weird to say this out loud, but our, our regulatory structure has been the gold standard for quite a while. And, you know, looking at getting a license in, say, the United Kingdom or in Canada, we would have to go through not exactly the same, but similar hoops in, in, in places like France and that, too. I mean, you, you need to demonstrate safety and you need to, to meet their regulations. So not only in terms of, like, you know, accident analysis, but showing that operators can operate things safely. Like, we would, we would need to do that for each, um, for each country specific to whatever their regulations actually are. But yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think uh, out there there's really a, com a country that we would be allowed to do business with in the United States that doesn't have some form of regulation similar to ours. Oh. Yeah. Sorry, I can't see who's got the mics. Oh, okay. Um, hi, I'm Becky, and um, I know at least one of the potential um, Democratic presidential um, candidates has talked about nuclear powers meeting future needs and perhaps um, being a positive factor in terms of climate change. So I wonder if you'd comment on that. On specifically? The climate change. The climate what is change. the impact on climate change? Right, that's a, that's a great question. So that's, I mean, really that's, that's driven... This slide gives a good representation of that, I guess, in, in that, unfortunately, while we're, we are a carbon-free power source in terms of when we're generating electricity, um, a lot of the climate change bills have focused on renewable energy, which is not necessarily what nuclear power is. I mean, we could right, use the breeder-type reactors to make our own fuel, but that's not renewable in the sense of, of wind or hydro or solar. And so as much as I know about that, you know, the, the I want to say it was like a year ago now, um, I was surprised at the bipartisanship of, of Congress uh, passing legislation to, to help research and development and fund uh, nuclear, n you know, new nuclear projects. And while, you know, new scale is, is a change from the operating fleet, we're still a water-based reactor and we rely a lot on the operating experience and and just the operation of, of of plants up to this point and there are other designs out there that are drastically different um, that are cooled by liquid metal and things like that and and that's really where like the long-term research is being done right now that that as far as I'm aware is, is what's being funded by the government but I can't comment too much on any one individual candidate's thoughts on this. Okay, hi, this is Mika. Um, I'm interested in what happens after 60 years to the land, the buildings. Um, I understand the used fuel is stored there, but if it wasn't stored there, what would happen to the rest of it? Is it contaminated? Yes, it is contaminated. It's, that's the low-level waste. So I talked about high-level waste. That's the fuel. Anything that is not inherently radioactive but comes into contact with radiation and is contaminated is low-level waste. So there's a lot of aspects of the plant infrastructure that would become activated and radioactive itself. And typically that stuff decays into a safe state fairly quickly. But there's a lot of things like, I think the closest analog would be, you know, nuclear submarines. What do we do when we dispose of those? They don't have the plant site themselves, but the most really uh, radioactive part of that is the vessel and the, and the reactor itself. And so 
you know, that decommissioning of that really involves taking it to a site like Hanford and burying that underground. And that's what we do with the fuel too. If we can't start recycling it or using it in new, new reactor designs, it would eventually also get put in a repository. And so the rest of the plant infrastructure, similar things would happen to that. It would get broken down and then it would be placed in repositories. And there's uh, throughout the last 10 or so years, you know, six, about six plants in the United States have started that process. Um, I know pretty soon, uh, Three Mile Island, I think it was just announced this last week or two, is, go is going to be shutting down pretty soon and they'll be starting that decommissioning process. And so, right, yeah, just really, you just really got to break it down and you got to put it, you just put it somewhere else. The site will be okay. I mean, that's that's the whole purpose is to is to keep all this all this contamination in a, in one self-contained area. So they decontaminate the site, yes, and it'll be reusable again. Okay, we're just about out of time, <clears throat> but this is Sylvia. I just want to tell you about a, a recycling about Hanford. Um, you know, it's been decom decommissioned. Um, is now a museum. A friend of mine just composed a very large-scale work. It's inside. It's like a cathedral on steroids. <laughs> and uh, the, the acoustics are unbelievable. And so there was a performance there just last weekend. That's amazing. It's called Nuclear Dreams, if you want to look it up. <laughs> okay. We thank you very much for your most thank informative you. session.